Americans watch TV for entertainment. We watch TV to learn more about Americans. Our education began in 1981, our first year in America after emigrating from Vietnam. I was seven years old and the ink on our green cards was still wet. We were thrust on the doorstep of a culture we knew very little about, a language we had yet to learn, and a country whose culture, technology, and innovation bordered on magic. To illustrate how lost we truly were, on the flight to America, the flight attendant gave us some diapers for my little sister. My mom didn't know what they were, so she used it as napkins to wipe the gravy off her face <laughs> from eating the TV dinner she was served on the plane. It could have been any TV, but for us, it was a Magnavox 19-inch color television. Used, but with a rag and a bottle of 409, my mom made it look like it had just come out of a Sears catalog. <laughs> I don't remember where we got it. Most of our clothes came from swap meets and garage sales. So it wasn't inconceivable that a neighbor sold us the TV and threw in a bag of old clothes for $20 and a handshake. The Magnavox may have occupied a dusty, dark corner in our neighbor's garage, but it commanded center stage in our household. My parents, three older sisters, one older brother, a younger sister and I squeezed into a tiny studio apartment. Our house in Vietnam was bigger. We slept on mattresses strewn on the floor and the beauty of this arrangement was that the Magnavox could be seen from anywhere. <laughs> and if any one of us craved a late night snack while watching TV, the refrigerator was only an arm's length away. <laughs> I mean, think about this. We didn't even have refrigeration in Vietnam, much less a TV, which made the Magnavox that much more magical. For a device to open a window into a culture we felt woefully inadequate to participate in. In the comfort, to do it in the comfort of our own home was a life raft we desperately clung to. The Magnavox was cultural immersion by a thousand pixels. My siblings and I were climbing the K-12 public school ladder. English was our second language and we were separated from other kids in special classes. Although it may have been necessary, it didn't do much to make us feel like we belonged. We had good ESL teachers, but Mr. Magnavox was the best. <laughs> it wasn't just English. He also knew math, science, and history. He was also a preacher and a philosopher. He never made us feel bad about pronouncing a word correctly or wearing sandals to school when we should be wearing shoes. We didn't have to buy a sh bring a shiny apple to school to buy his affection. All that he demanded from us was to show up, be on time, and be quiet. One of the very first shows I remember watching was Planet of the Apes. It was usually on late at night when we all should have been sleeping, but there was something mesmerizing about watching a bunch of monkeys talk. <laughs> the show painted a world, Ill, uh, a world where illiterate humans were subservient to a dominant race of primates who spoke eloquent English. Maybe it was just fun watching monkeys master a language in a way I was envious of. Maybe I saw a little bit of myself in the lesser evolved humans. All that is to say, my first American role model was a chimpanzee. Nothing presented a starker contrast between our lives and that of white America than lifestyles of the rich and famous. <laughs> yes. Robin Leach and his obnoxious English accent showed us extravagant mansions, million dollar yachts and private jets, country clubs and five star resorts exclusive to us where the price of admission was beyond our reach. Luxuries that we could see but never touch. 
while he and his wealthy friends were drunk on champagne wishes and caviar dreams. We sat on the floor and ate white rice sprinkled with baby power formula and drank tang from a plastic cup. It wasn't all rich white people. In the 1980s, there were smatterings of people of color on TV. We saw some of our struggles in the families on Sanford and Sons in 227. Even though they were the exceptions rather than the rule, the successes of the Jeffersons and the Cosbys were examples of the possibilities before us. Somewhere in his dreams, a little Vietnamese boy thought it possible to one day become a doctor. Or if that didn't work out, to be adopted by a lonely rich white guy <laughs> like Arnold on different strokes. For my three older sisters who were in various stages of teenagery, daytime soaps were must-see TV. They needed some pointers on how to deal with white guys with Asian fetishes. So Jade from General Hospital was their guiding light. We were young and restless, desperate to be bold and beautiful. And as the world turned, like sand through the hourglass, so were gone the days of our lives watching too much goddamn TV. Because food stamps didn't pay for Little League, organized sports were off limits to me and my brother. So while the boys from our school were running the bases, we sat at home and watched baseball on TV. Mr. Magnavox played no small role in cultivating our love of the San Diego Padres. In 1984, they were up against the Detroit Tigers in the World Series. Everyone had caught Padres fever, including our neighbor who was a Vietnam vet, who hung a stuffed tiger by the neck on his porch, like one of those roasted Peking ducks at an re Asian restaurant, just to be able to give him a high five and say that we were Padres fans too in a small way, made us feel more American. We climbed the social ladder, moving from the studio apartment into a two bedroom rental. There was more room for Mr. Magnavox and my brand new baby brother, who was welcomed into the world when I was nine years old. Fortunately by then, we knew what to do with diapers. <laughs> the moment he left my mom's womb, he was an American citizen, while the rest of us who were taking turns feeding him and bathing him were still resident aliens. He was crowned the golden child and quite literally was bathed in gold. His bath was nine parts water and one part Michelob gold light. <laughs> Apparently beer is good for a baby's skin. On one particular day when I was angry at him for something, my mom pulled me aside and said, son, don't be mad at him. He's the reason they will never kick us out of America. It never even occurred to me that we could be deported. Weren't we a model immigrant family? My siblings and I were doing well in school. When my parents were not cleaning people's homes, they were taking night classes at a community college. My mom was close to realizing every, woman's, every Vietnamese woman's dream of owning a hair salon. My dad earned an associate's degree in engineering, which landed him a job building ships for the Navy. We saw a little bit of ourselves in the Keatons on family ties. We didn't look like them or talk like them, but my dad had a 401k. Wasn't that a prerequisite for entry into middle-class America? But I'm being honest, we didn't function like the middle-class families on TV. The Keens talked about their feelings and shared their successes and failures together. We didn't celebrate straight A's on our report card by going to Baskin Robbins. We swallowed every failure alone.
It was never a cause for commiseration at the dinner table. At times, it seemed like we were just ships passing through the night. But we found communion in other ways, like church on Sundays, or camping trips during the summer, or the Cosby show on Thursday nights. It was one of the few shows we all watched religiously together. But the gorilla glue of family bonding wasn't even an American show. It was imported Vietnamese kung fu soap operas. Yeah, yeah it's a mouthful and more, even more difficult to explain. But imagine Bruce Lee teaming up with Captain Marvel. They roam the land kicking villainous asses with magical karate moves. And then Captain Marvel, plagued with Victor's guilt, has pity sex with Thanos, and together they have a baby. And a jilted Bruce Lee shaves his head and enters a monastery and meditates about being like water. <laughs> we married Mr. Magnavox with a VCR because these kung fu soap operas were on VHS tapes. On weekends, we rented stacks of them. We binged on these shows before there was even a concept of Netflix. It was always a family affair. And we talked about them around the water family water cooler the way co-workers would talk about the Game of Thrones. Maybe it was just mind-numbing entertainment spoken in Vietnamese where my parents could understand. Maybe it was a brief reprieve from the reality of life on Amer in America. Or maybe it was a show that we could watch from beginning to end without commercials. In the 1980s, there were a lot of commercials. If the church of capitalism is built on a foundation of consumerism, then Mr. Magnavox was a devout preacher. It didn't matter what your skin color or what language you spoke. The only requirement was a devotion to the religion of money. Our cupboards were stocked with frosted flakes and lucky charms because a tiger and a leprechaun told us that's what Americans ate. When I tasted gum for the first time, the flavor was just as heavenly as the double mint twins. <laughs> Infomercials were 30 minute long commercials masquerading as TV shows. We couldn't afford a night out at Sizzlers, but somehow a thigh master ended up in our house. And those pesky TV evangelicals, what product were they selling? Just the promise of salvation and the forgiveness of our sins, as long as we sent Jimmy Swagger to check every week. <laughs> Mr. Magnavox ran into some health problems. <laughs> his age was showing, and he was losing his color. The red, too, bled out, my father said after examining him which meant that everything on the screen was in various shades of green. Elmo was a dark green, the Padres uniform was a light green, and Ronald Reagan was an olive green. In retrospect, it seemed rather fitting. To live in America is to see the world through glasses tinted, the color of money. Mr. Magnavox had a knob to turn the power off and on. The knob was tricky because sometimes you couldn't turn the TV back on after you turned it off. It was the anniversary of my grandmother's death. We set up an altar next to the TV upon which we placed a framed picture, some candles and incense. Catholic tradition called for 100 Hail Marys and 50 Our Fathers, but the Padres were fighting for the playoff lives that same night. Maybe it was because the Padres mascot is a friar, but my parents did not object to leaving the TV on so long as we kept the volume muted. So while we prayed for my grandmother's soul and for her to sit at the right hand of the father, my brother and I prayed for Tony Gwynn <laughs> to slap a single into left field. In 1987, my family realized the American dream of buying a home. It was a three bedroom in the suburbs of Mira Mesa. 
Sadly, Mr. Magnavox did not make the move. He retired to a landfill to join the Slinkies and the Flobies to begin their 10,000 year journey towards decomposition. I think he knew that our American education was ready, ready for a promotion. Armed with a 30 year mortgage, we were banging on the door of middle class America. But first, we went to Sears and bought a brand new TV. Thank you. <laughs>